Gospels to the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, this is part two of a message I began last week entitled, Thou Art Greatly Beloved. Thou Art Greatly Beloved. This is part two, Daniel chapter 9. We're going to read verses 21 through 23. And then we're going to jump right over to Daniel chapter 10 and we're going to read verses 11, 18, and 19. I'll guide you. Daniel chapter 9, Thou Art Greatly Beloved, part two. Let's all stand up, please, for the reading of God's word. Daniel chapter 9, beginning with verse 21. Yea, Daniel says, while I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, now the man he's talking about is the angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. That's about 6 o'clock at night. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O oh, Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. In fact, if you were to read Chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, is a 490 year prophecy that has everything to do with the coming of Christ. So that's what God was revealing through the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Look what he says in verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come forth to show thee, he says, for thou art greatly beloved. Daniel, you are greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Go over to chapter 10 beginning with verse 10, and we'll read verse 11. And behold, an hand touched me, that's the angel Gabriel, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel, a man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright. For unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Drop right down to verses 18 and 19. Then there came again, and touched me one like the appearance of a man. This is Gabriel, the angel. And he strengthened me and said, O man, greatly beloved, fear not. Peace be unto thee. Be strong, yea, be strong. And when he had spoken unto me, I was strengthened and said, Let my Lord speak, for thou hast strengthened me. You know, a lot of people today say that they're sitting down talking with angels, and, uh, and, and I don't have, uh, blood, but you can talk with an angel. You know, I, I talk with my wife every day. That'll make the butter run, right? But in the Bible, when an angel of heaven came down in his glory, people fell flat on their face and they were strengthless. And they had to be picked up by the nap of their neck and strengthened supernaturally to be able to stand in the presence of an angel. Amen? Daniel, thou art greatly beloved. Let's go to the throne of grace. Our Father and our God, as we consider this subject today, part two, thou art greatly beloved. Oh, my Father, I would pray that you'd help us apply this to our lives. Lord, that we'd hear you say this to us, Thou art greatly beloved in my sight. Lord, I pray you to anoint this preacher with feet of clay, strengthenly, mightily by thy grace and spirit, both uh, with might in the inner man and the outer man, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now let me give you a quick review of what's going on. You may be seated. Last week we learned that Daniel, and Daniel alone, had the singular distinction among all the men of God of being the only one that God ever sent the angel Gabriel to to tell him three times, Daniel, thou art greatly beloved. Thou art greatly beloved. <clears throat> and he said it again. Thou art greatly beloved. Beloved, he didn't say thou art somewhat beloved. He didn't say thou art a little bit beloved. He didn't say thou art kind of beloved. He said God told me to tell you that thou art greatly beloved. Would you say amen out there? You see, beloved, God never ever said that to anyone else in the scripture, even though Often he praised good, holy men, uh, righteous men and women, beloved, and conveyed his divine approval and favor upon them for their faithfulness and their loyalty to him. He saw that God never said, Thou art greatly beloved to the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God never said, Thou art greatly beloved to any prophet or any priest or any king. And God never said, Thou art greatly beloved to his pious saints, be it a man or a woman, beloved. Daniel alone has the exclusive honor of being told this by God. Now Daniel uh, and his friend Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad amigo, <laughs> and Abednego, beloved, had gone into Babylonian captivity, as we saw last week, as teenagers. And yet he and them, when tested by threats of death by their captors, still remained faithful to God throughout their life, from their youth 
to their old age, even though their life was threatened by their captives. If you don't do what we're telling you to do, we're going to kill you. But see, these kids had some convictions in them. Amen? So, beloved, Daniel's character was so morally and spiritually outstanding. It was so upright and impressive to both God and man that we saw that even his captors took notice of him and they chose him to occupy positions of power and authority in the government rather than their own fellow citizens, the aristocrats, the noblemen, the overlords. Can you imagine bringing some captives in and yet the, the king looks at them and says, these guys are something else and they're kids and I'm going to put them above my noblemen and I'm going to put them above my aristocrats and I'm going to put above my overlords and they're going to help me run the kingdom and we saw that that phrase greatly beloved Hemda, had a full meaning of a plethora of meaning of nuances especially as we look at in the Hebrew beloved it means many different things and just briefly I just wanted to tell you give you a refresher beloved it meant that God was saying to him something like this Daniel thou art a man in whom I dearly delight and desire to be with Above all others, I delight in you, Daniel. And it means, beloved, that thou art a man who is a special object of my attention and my appreciation. You're a special object of my affection. And can you imagine, Daniel, beloved, I'm so insignificant. How could God ever take notice of me? But he did, didn't he? And, beloved, it also means that thou art a man who is highly esteemed, highly valued, highly, highly treasured in heaven. In other words, God was saying something like this, Daniel, I love you. You are a cherished treasure in my sight. Thou art greatly beloved. Would you say amen out there? And beloved, it means that you were someone who was so precious to me that you were a favorite of, a favorite of mine. You know, I'd love to have God say of me, you know, that Joel down there, that preacher on Carver Road, he's a favorite of mine. How would you like to have God say that about you? How would you like to have him say it about me? <laughs> well, you see, beloved, when God said that, you're a favorite of mine. He says, so my divine approval, my divine favor and blessing now rests upon you. So that kind of brings us up to snuff. And we're going to begin with uh, the second part today. But I, I want to give you three familiar principles, ladies and gentlemen, that we can copy from Daniel so God will perhaps say to you and I, Thou art greatly beloved. What do you think? So number one, beloved, Daniel had strong convictions. Daniel had strong convictions. I want you to go to Daniel chapter 1. Turn back to Daniel chapter 1. And I want us to look through verses 5 through 8. The Bible says, And the king appointed them a daily provision, that's King Nebuchadnezzar, of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years that at the end thereof he, they might stand before the king. Now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs, that's Melzazar, gave names, for he gave unto, Dan, uh, unto Daniel the name Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and of Mishael, Meshach, and of Azariah, Abednego. Verse number 9. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not, he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now what's amazing to me, beloved, as we look at this text is this. Is that Daniel knew both what he believed and knew in whom he believed. Would you say amen? Question is, do you? Sometimes we forget that this Jesus is the king of the universe, don't we? And so, beloved, the Jews at that time were eating kosher. That means clean foods. There was foods that they couldn't eat. They were unclean foods. That's what the pagans ate. But the Jews could only eat kosher foods at that time. So here's old pagan king Nebuchadnezzar, beloved. He's trying to force these three Hebrew children, really four with Daniel, to eat these unclean foods. He's trying to shove it down their throat, and he's doing it on pain of death. You hear me, kids? Teenagers. Daniel was threatened. If you don't eat the king's meat, you're going to die. And yet he had his convictions screwed down tight, didn't he? It says Daniel refused, notice the word it uses, to defile himself, guile. That is to morally and spiritually pollute. 
to morally and spiritually desecrate his body with these unclean foods from the pagan king Nebuchadnezzar's table. Moreover, beloved, neither should we, by the way. You listen to me now. Our bodies, the Bible says, is the temple of the Holy Spirit on this earth. Amen? In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 to 20, the Bible says this. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Therefore you are bought with a price, so therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now the Gnostics of the day said, don't worry about what you do in your body, because the flesh is corrupt. Just worry about the spirit. God redeems us, body, soul, and spirit. Would you say amen? So what you ha do in your body has everything to do with how God looks at us. Come on and say amen out there. So what are you saying to me, Pastor? I'm saying so we Christians shouldn't defile our bodies with fornication. And we shouldn't defile it with pornography or drugs. We shouldn't defile it with drunkenness. We shouldn't defile it with tobacco because it belongs to God. Now God's word will in ways were so instilled, they were so drilled into Daniel's heart from his youth right through to his old age uh, that he dedicated and consecrated his life to God and Daniel lived by a strict moral and spiritual code of ethics and beliefs. It's vitally important that all mankind have a value system that they live by. Amen? So Daniel had one and he was only a kid because mom and dad spent the time to drill it into him. I know when my kids were growing up, people used to say to me, Pastor Joe, why does that make any difference? You know, you're not letting them do that. No, there's a reason. One of these days, they're going to be out from under me, and they're going to have to live on their own, and they're going to have their own family. And more is caught than taught. And so if they see me doing it, they'll catch a hold of it, and they'll pass it on to their children. Come on and say amen out there. But anyways, beloved, he lived with this code of ethics, this, these beliefs that shaped his character and shaped his conduct and shaped his convictions. Question is, do you have any of that? Do you have a moral and spiritual code of ethics? Do you have beliefs, beloved, that you claim to live by that also shape your life? And I mean good, bad, or indifferent. Take a look at yourself. See whether or not you do. Oh, listen to me, beloved. Right now, counts forever with God. Amen? You see, right now, beloved, God is watching. Right now, the Bible says God is examining our life 24-7. Nothing is hidden from this God. And beloved, nothing escapes his omniscient eye or scrutiny of us as with Daniel here. King Solomon said to his son Rehoboam, okay, when you read the book of Proverbs, a lot of this is addressed to his successor and son, King Rehoboam. But Solomon said this to his son Rehoboam in Proverbs 15.3. Listen to what he said. He said, the eyes of the Lord are in every place, every place, beholding the evil and the good. In other words, this ubiquitous God, this all-seeing eye of God is everywhere at the same time. He's omniscient. Come on and say amen out there. You see, beloved, I'm asking you, do you have strong moral and spiritual convictions like Daniel? that you use to daily govern and guide your life by before both God and man? Or do you just run with the devil's crowd? You just run with whatever the world's doing? Or do you just uh, go along to get along? Or do you just, uh, you're so afraid of the consequences that you're afraid to speak up or stand up and take a stand? I hope you're not. The Bible says having done all, we're to do what? We're to stand. And I pray that you do. Or, beloved, you have scriptural principles that are part of your moral and spiritual makeup that you live by. Because you want to try to please God, and you want to try to honor God, and you want to try to impress God like Daniel did, so that he'll say to you, Thou art greatly beloved, my child. Amen. Thou art greatly beloved, teenager. Thou art greatly beloved, young uh, uh, adult in the prime of your life. Thou art greatly beloved, mom and dad. I've been watching you. I've been watching how you raise your family. Thou art greatly beloved, mature middle-ager. That'd be me. <laughs> no. Thou art greatly beloved, elderly person. You know, it comes to a point where you start going over that hill, that snowball goes fast and hard, doesn't it, Gary? <laughs> Thou art greatly beloved, saint. Thou art greatly beloved, pastor. Thou art greatly beloved, elder. 
Thou art greatly beloved, you demons. Uh, excuse me, deacons. Thou art greatly beloved. In other words, you're someone I'm proud of and I delight in. You're someone that is one of my favorites up here in heaven. You're someone that is a person that's highly esteemed by me up here in glory. And you're someone that's a cherished treasure in my sight. In fact, you're the apple of my eye. And the reason you are is because when I look down on you, I see that you walk the walk and you talk the talk. Come on and say amen out there. According to your convictions, according to your code of ethics, according to your beliefs, you walk the walk and you talk the talk before me. In other words, beloved, if God was saying, so you're no hypocrite in my sight, you're no phony or fraud in my sight like a lot of Christians are, I got a call this week from someone down south, and they were telling me about uh, these Christians walking around with scriptures all over their t-shirts, but they live like the uh, filthy as a barnyard dog. And God was saying, when you, when you live for God and you walk the walk and talk the talk, God looks at you, he says, you're no pretender, you're no compromiser in my sight. In other words, he looks at us and he says, you're the real deal, so I want you to know thou art greatly beloved by me. Not kinda, not little, greatly beloved by me. Would you say amen? As with Daniel, God says, I even boast and brag about you, about your holy and righteous and godly conduct and convictions to everyone up here in heaven. I boast to the cherubims about you. I boast to the seraphims about you. I, break, I boast to the holy angels about you. I, I boast to the church triumphant up in heaven about you. And I boast about your strong beliefs. And I boast about your strong convictions. And I boast about your strong principles. So I want you to know, I want you to personally know that thou art greatly beloved by me. Come on and say amen. Now listen carefully, beloved. Generally speaking, God does indeed love everyone. I want you to hear that. God loves all the unsaved people of this world because they are made in his image and likeness. And that's why Jesus, the most quoted verse of all the scripture, John 3, 16, say with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. And God loves all the redeemed. God loves the redeemed as our Heavenly Father, beloved. We are the objects of His paternal love and affection in Christ. In fact, in Jeremiah 31, 3, God says to His people, Yea, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Come on and say amen. And, beloved, God loves all of the backsliders. You see, He does. Yes, He does. Uh, he's like a concerned parent, beloved. He's trying to correct them. He's trying to protect them from themselves. And he's trying to restore them. Amen. He wants to reclaim them uh, from the power and the penalty of their sin. For example, Jesus said to the lukewarm church in Laodicea in Revelation chapter 3, verse 19, Jesus said this, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If you are a true Christian and you turn your back on God, God will send the hound of heaven after you. That's the Holy Spirit. And he will shake you every way but loose until he gets your attention. Why? Because he hates you? No. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If you endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if you be without chastisement, he says, then are you bastards, your fatherless children. And you've got no part in God whatsoever. That's Hebrews chapter 12. And verse 5, and I won't quote the rest of the chapter to you. But God chastens his children just like a uh, parent would chasten their children. Now, I've taught you before that the word chastening in the New Testament is the Greek word paideia. It means the child train. Yes, sometimes God has to take you out to the woodshed and, and put a, uh, the board of education across your seat of learning, okay? He's trying to get your attention. But there's other times what God does is he chastens us through blessings. Even I've seen the worst backslider, God was trying to get rid of him, and then God richly blessed them. That person finally fell on their face and got right with God, and the preacher comes along and says to him, you know, that's Romans 2, 4, that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. And God blessed them because he knew their heart, the proclivity, the bent of their heart would be to that scripture, and ultimately, beloved, he dealt with them and he saved them. Would you say amen out there? 
So what I'm saying to you, beloved, is this here. That uh, God has an extraordinary, not just an ordinary type of love and blessing for all those who impress him like Daniel did. So, Pastor Joel, are you saying this? Are you saying that God shows favoritism to some people and not to others? Yep. That's exactly what I'm saying to you. But, Pastor Joel, I thought that the Scriptures taught that God shows no favoritism to anyone, but treats us all the same. That's true. Well, is this an oxymoron then, Pastor Joel? Which is it? You're talking out of both sides of your mouth? No, beloved. That's true. But only when it comes to matters of salvation and judging does God show no favoritism. Now hear me. The Bible consistently teaches that God both blesses and He rewards people according to His own sovereign will and purpose in Christ, depending on the faith and depending on the character and depending on the uh, 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 conduct that He sees whether or not that person is living good, bad, or indifferent. And so God will deal with that person accordingly, good, bad, or indifferent. For example, beloved, the Bible says this, that God gives more grace to the humble. Now, the Bible teaches God gives grace to everybody, but those who humble themselves in their sight get more grace. Amen? Is God showing favoritism? Uh-huh. But it's not in matters of salvation and judging, is it? See, the Bible says God gives more mercy to those who fear Him. If God did not pour out His mercy on this earth, Every man, every woman, every child on the top side of this earth would be goosed up in the devil's hell right now. But God has shown mercy to them. But the Bible says this, that God shows more mercy to those who fear him. So if you want to get more mercy from God, you must fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. That's Proverbs 1.7. What did you say, man, out there? 4.7, excuse me. And the Bible says, beloved, God gives more blessings to the obedient more blessings to the faithful. So why shouldn't he also give more love to the Daniels of this world that he sees in the body of Christ? You see, God deeply loved and enjoyed Daniel. And Daniel, upon hearing that thou art greatly beloved, beloved, I believe it brought great love and delight to Daniel's heart. What do you think? Beloved, I believe it motivated and it stimulated Daniel to have even a greater love, a greater fervor, a greater longing for God and it should also do that to us. The more you please God, beloved, I can assure you, the more He's going to please you. Oh, beloved, listen to me. So in this matter, what I'm saying is God shows favoritism. Now let me illustrate what I'm, what I'm saying to you. We've all heard about teachers' pets, right? There are some children, many teachers seem to have one student that they have a special bond with them. And I want to use myself as an illustration if I could. There was a teacher, I'll call her Mrs. Spaghetti because her name rhymes with it. And she was a very prim and proper girl, a young, well, she was probably in her early 20s. And when the kids in the class would do good and get A's, she'd give them a candy cane. Now me, I was always joking around. And she would say to me, oh, will you sit down? I said, okay, teacher, you know. And then I'd be kidding around, and I'd take a straw, roll it up, and <laughs> you know, spoot a little spitball and hit somebody in the back of the head. And so she said, and if you've got an A today, stand up, please. And the kids would stand up, and she'd give them a candy cane. And here's Joel fooling around, and finally she says, Joel, you come up here. I, yes, teacher, yes, Mrs. Spaghetti. I love the spaghetti, you know. Ah, that's pretty good. She says, you get under my desk. I said, what? She says, get under my desk. I said, okay. So here she is. She's handing out candy canes to everybody, and she says, you can sit down now. She takes two out and puts them under that. She gives them to me. <laughs> And I nudged her leg, I said, thank you. You know, years ago, there used to be a song by Frank Sinatra. Now, you kids who are younger, you probably don't remember it. But it was this. I got you under my skin. I got you deep in the heart of me. You're really a part of me. Remember you, folks remember that song? And some people, you get under your skin, right? You say, I love that person. The world's a better place with that person in it. Parents, you tell me if this is true. They love all their children, but sometimes... There's one child that they have a special bond and affection and relationship with and a stronger love for. There's that one child. They all love all their kids, but somehow this child just seems to get under their skin. Amen. So, beloved, the same thing is true with God. For example, in James uh, 20, verse 2, the Bible says, John 
was a disciple that Jesus loved. Now, perhaps it was because John was a young buck. The other disciples are a little bit older, but John's just a kid. And he's the one that leaned on Jesus' breast all the time. And you can just see the affection that Jesus poured out upon him. Now, did Jesus love all the other apostles? Of course he did. But he had a special affection for John, didn't he? Would you say amen out there? Now, beloved, God did not just send any angel to Daniel. That's something we need to understand. God sent the specific angel, the angel Gabriel, to him, of whom Luke 1.19 says, stands in the very presence of God. Imagine that, beloved, Gabriel standing face to face with God all the time till God dispatches him to go do what God wants him to do. Now, he was a special angel. He was sent on a very important mission for God. For example, God sent the angel Gabriel as his divine messenger to tell Zacharias, Zacharias, you're going to have a son, even in your old age, you and Elizabeth, and you're going to call this son John. He's, that's John the Baptist, and he is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. Would you say amen? He's going to fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah about the coming of the Messiah. He's the uh, Elijah that the Old Testament was pointing to who would be manifested in the person of John the Baptist. And God sent the angel Gabriel as his divine messenger to the Virgin Mary. He said, Mary, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And when he does, you are going to be pregnant with the Holy, from the Holy Ghost. And you're going to have a son. You're going to name his name Jesus. That is Emmanuel, God with us. Would you say amen? And so here, beloved, God sent the angel Gabriel, his divine messenger, to tell uh, Daniel, to make known to Daniel the prophetic secrets concerning the future, and also that he was greatly beloved. I wish I had time to develop Daniel 9, 24 through 27, 3, because that brings you right up into the baptism of Jesus. But God was giving him insight. Remember, they had been in 70 years of Babylonian captivity. Uh, Daniel was reading the book of Jeremiah. He sees it's coming to an end right now. He's saying, what's going to happen now? And God tells him. God sends his angel, angel Gabriel to him. So therefore, beloved, as his reward for being greatly beloved, for his, lawyer, his reward of loyalness and faithfulness, God gave Daniel, as you read the book, supernatural revelation, supernatural visions. He gave him deep understandings of things. Some people just have penetrating insight into things. And so God gave this to Daniel because of that. He also gave him deep understanding of interpretation of dreams, and he gave him wisdom. You know, Solomon understood this because God, well, when he prayed to God, uh, when God came upon him in a dream, Solomon uh, didn't ask for riches. He didn't ask for money. He said, Lord, I am a ch but a child when he became king. He says, I don't know how to go in or go out. I don't know my left hand from my right hand. What I want is wisdom to be able to run, uh, lead your people. And so God gives King Solomon wisdom more than any other person save Jesus Christ on the top side of this earth. And so as Solomon is end ending the end of his reign, his son Rehoboam is coming up now and he's being trained as the king to take over Israel. And so Solomon says this to Rehoboam in uh, Proverbs 4, 7. He says, Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom, and with all thy getting, Jeroboam, get understanding. And by the way, that goes for you and I also. He was saying to Rehoboam in Proverbs chapter uh, 8, verse 35, he says, Whoso findeth wisdom findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. You find wisdom, you find life. You find life, you find a, 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 a favor with the Lord. You see, beloved, so I'm this morning, do you want to find spiritual life and eternal life, then find wisdom just like Daniel did. I'm saying to you, do you want to obtain favor with God, real favor with God? Then what you need to do is find uh, wisdom just like Daniel did. And beloved, uh, if you want to uh, have God supernaturally enlighten you and illuminate your mind, then you need to find wisdom like Daniel did. In James chapter 1, Verses 5 through 8, the Bible says this, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who give it to all men liberally, and upbraideth not. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. 
Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord, because a guy like that is a double-minded man, and he's unstable in all his ways. Double-minded, he oscillates, vacillates, can't make up his mind. Should I do this? Should I do that? I don't know if I would do that. Make up your mind. The worst decision is indecision, isn't it? And I told you, you can make the wrong decision for the right reasons, and God will bless you. And it'll put you back on the right path. I'm saying that God says to faithful people, faithful people with strong convictions like Daniel, not only thou art great and the beloved, but he says also that he richly rewards them with his gifts and with his graces and with his wisdom, just like Daniel, because of his obedience of faith. Amen? Again, Solomon said to Rehoboam, his son, in Proverbs 3.1, he said, My son, forget not thy law, my law, but let thy heart keep my commandments. And then he went on to say, So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of God uh, uh, Almighty. Now can you imagine, beloved, obeying God, God says, you find favor in my sight. He says, not only that, beloved, you'll, under, you'll get good understanding. You know, a lot of people only read the New Testament. Listen, I, I don't even like to call it the New Testament. The Newer Testament, the Older Testament is still relevant for us. Now, there's portions that Israel fulfilled, for sure, but the moral and spiritual principles that were taught them in the Old Testament apply to you and I today. So it's important to see how God deals with people, how God deals with nations. How do I learn it? By studying the Old Testament. And how God dealt with sinners, and how God dealt with nations, and how God dealt with His people. So you can understand what God's doing. Would you say amen out there? So that was point number one. Daniel had strong convictions. Number two, Daniel had stout-hearted courage. Stout-hearted courage. I want you to look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. It says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who hath appointed your meat, your food, and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are your sort? Then he shall make me endanger my head to the king. In other words, if I start following your advice, Daniel, you're going to lop my head off. Then said Daniel to Melchizedek, that's the eunuch, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. <coughs> Excuse me. He says, prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days. And let them give us pulse to eat. The word pulse, zera, means vegetables. Let us go on a vegetarian diet. Give us pulse, he says, to eat and water to drink. Then let your countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. In other words, if they look better than us, deal with us the way you have to. But if we look better than them, let us keep doing what we're doing. The Bible says in verse 14, so he consented. Melchizedek said, okay, I'll give you a shot. I'll give you 10 days to do it to them in this matter. And he proved them 10 days. But love, what jumps out to me is this. Even in captivity, Daniel was bold. Daniel was brave, wasn't he? Daniel was fearless, ladies and gentlemen. He was no cringing or capitulating or compromising coward like the other Jews were. They said, okay, we'll eat of the king's meat because we don't want to die. If we keep to these kosher meals, you know what? They're going to kill us. But Daniel said, I'd rather die than disobey God. And so therefore, beloved, they felt like they had to eat the unclean foods. But not Daniel, not Shadrach, Meshach, and Abad Amigo, I'll tell you. And the eunuch, beloved, he could have been killed himself for not, uh, by King Nebuchadnezzar for letting Daniel do this. But Daniel stood up for God, beloved. Daniel stood up and did what he believed in. And, beloved, he did what was right in God's sight. Even, beloved, he convinced... That's <laughs> unbelievable. Imagine a teenager convincing the eunuch, Melchizedek, for 10 days, uh, put us on this low-calorie vegetarian diet as opposed to the high-calorie, high-meat diet with all the wine with all the calories, and take a look at our face afterwards and see whether or not we look any better, we look any healthier. And I can just see Melchizedek, the eunuch, going, mm. you know, my head's on the chopping block on this. Then he says, give us 10 days. 
Get nothing to lose. Ten days. See what happens in ten days. Amen? Well, beloved, I want to tell you something. At the end of ten days on that low-calorie vegetation diet, I want you to see what happens. Look at verses 15 and 16. He said, at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat of the portion of the king's meat. These were the other Jews that compromised their convictions and their courage because they were afraid. Thus Belshazzar took away the portion of their meat and their wine that they should drink, and he gave them pulse to eat. Beloved, what a miracle. I want you to know at the end of ten days, here's a low-calorie diet. Now remember, in most vegetables, you don't have any fat. You have fiber, you have water, and you may have a, 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 some carbohydrate, but not usually too much unless it's a tuber or a, a sweet potato or a baked potato or a, uh, here today, gone tomato, something like that, okay? <laughs> but here they are on a low-calorie diet, and you can just see these other Jewish teenagers, they've got a leg of lamb in their mouth and they're charring on it, or a pork chop in their mouth and they're charring on it, and they're drinking all the wine and they're eating all the high-calorie uh, uh, pastries and everything. But at the end of 10 days, the Bible says Daniel and his friends were fairer and fatter than all of them. God supernaturally intervened. And he made that low-calorie food a high-calorie food and a very nutritious food. Come on and say amen. Oh, that's why we say grace over our food every day. Amen. Lord, supernaturally bless this food to my body that it may nourish me and strengthen me and I may bring you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. For we ask it in the Christ's name with mercy and thanksgiving through faith. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, consequently, the eunuch Melchizedek was totally convinced. He became totally convinced that Daniel's God had indeed worked a miracle for them. And so he says, you know what? You want to char on salary and whatever else you want to char, go ahead and do it. Because I know it's not you who's doing it anyways. It is your God who's blessing that food, just making you stronger and healthier and fairer and fatter than all the Jews that had compromised and eaten the king's meat. Come on and say amen out there. What are you driving at, Pastor? What's the point? Well, the point is this, beloved, that God richly blesses those who have a bold and a brave and a fearless, a, a courageous heart and take a stand from Him, especially when their life is on the line. I've seen a lot of Christians over the years who are in church, they talk a good talk, but as soon as they get out into the world and their feet go in the fire and everybody's around, what, what, you're one of those? They capitulate. I hope that's not you, and I hope it's not me. You see, beloved, Daniel wasn't afraid of the consequences. He wasn't afraid of being different or being counterculture like us Christians are supposed to be. Daniel wasn't afraid. He didn't care what man or others thought of him. Are you? In Proverbs 29, 25, beloved, it says this. It says that the fear of man bringeth a snare, but whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man, what does it do? It ensnares you. You let everybody intimidate you. I refuse to let that happen to me. I always look at men, they're made in the image of likeness of God like I am. They put their pants on the same way I do. And I say a few other things to myself that I won't tell you. But they're just mortal like I am. They're flesh. And I'm not going to let them intimidate me. I don't care what they have to say. And that's where Daniel was, beloved. In other words, it was a great lesson to learn if you really want to please God and you want to hear God say to you, Thou art greatly beloved. You see, God saw him stand up for him when his life was threatened. And God saw him stand up for truth when his life was threatened. And God saw him stand up for his faith when his life was threatened, beloved. I'm saying that when the pressure was on and it was a life and death situation, the God of heaven was watching the courage and the bravado of Daniel. And God was so totally impressed. He was so moved by what he saw Daniel do, beloved, that he said, Gabriel, you need to leave my presence right now. Go down to that young man and you tell him, thou art greatly beloved before me. I've been watching him since his youth. I've been watching him down there in captivity. Thou art greatly beloved. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, but this wasn't the only time, as you read the book of Daniel, that Daniel exhibited such uncompromising courage. 
For example, when Daniel was threatened uh, uh, with death by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, like we see here, he took his stand and he refused, absolutely refused, to eat the king's food and he would have died because of it if God didn't work a miracle. And beloved, when he was threatened by King Belshazzar, that was the uh, successor, that was the grandson of King Nebuchadnezzar, for not worshiping his gods, the Bible says that Daniel took his stand. He wouldn't do it. And he defied the king and he refused to worship anyone except Yehovah, the God of Israel. Would you say amen? And then when the Babylonians were conquered by the Medo-Persians, the Bible says that when King Darius of Medo-Persia reigned, who had been deceived by his presidents and his princes who were jealous of Daniel, beloved, they went over to King uh, Darius and they said, look it. They didn't say this to him, but this is what they, the text said, basically. We hate this guy. And the only way we're going to entrap him and get rid of him, because we've been promoted above us, is to get him to worship his God instead of King Darius. So without King Darius knowing this, and King Darius loved Daniel, the Bible said. So they deceived King Darius in the passing a law for 30 days that anybody that did not worship the golden image that he set up on the plain of Dura was to be thrown into the lion's den. He was to be killed. And so they went behind Daniel's back, and they did that, beloved. And the Medo-Persians, whenever you signed, they signed the law, you could not erase that law. You had to sign it with another law that would override that. But Darius did not know that this was to get rid of Daniel. So the Bible says that when they found, he found out about it, and he had to throw Daniel into the lion's den. And Darius goes over to the pit and he says, Daniel, Daniel, thy God, thy God will save thee. The Bible says he paced the floor all night. The next morning he says, oh, Daniel, has thy God saved thee? And he says, oh, king, live forever. He says, the God of heaven has sent his angel and shut the mouths of the lions. Then he says, come forth and come hither. And the Bible says what Darius did then, he took the presidents and the preachers, the princes that had deceived them, and he threw them and their families and their children into the lion's den. And the Bible says before they even hit the ground, the lions break their bones in pieces. Before they even hit the, the bottom of the pit. Can you imagine that? You know, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, would you say amen? Power, love, a sound mind. You know, beloved, it's so many people today have lost their ability to uh, inductive and deductive reasoning. And we can go along to get along and somebody teaches us and we just accept it and what it is without really having a chance to step back and say, let me think this through. Lord, I need insight in this. That's a sound mind considers all the facts, it collates all the facts, it weighs all the facts, amen? And when you have that, beloved, you make your decisions based on facts and faith and not fear. Would you say amen? Now, beloved, God loves and blesses his people who exhibit boldness, who exhibit bravado for him. But he has little or no use for them who don't and won't. If God is not in the business of loving cowards that are amongst his people. Our Lord Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. He says, whosoever refuses to confess him before the Father, and they denied him before the Father, he says that I will deny you before the Father. I won't confess you before the Father. Go ahead, go out there. And they said they're going to kill you, and you're afraid to admit that you're a, a Christian, you believe in me. But you deny me, I'll deny you, and you'll seal your uh, soul forever. In the pit of hell. Our Lord Jesus said in Mark 8, 38, He said that whosoever shall save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospel's sake, He says the same shall find it. In other words, beloved, He says this. He's saying that there's gain through loss with God for those who have the courage to stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And our Lord Jesus warned in Luke eleven twenty three. 23, he said, He that is not with me is against me. If you're not with God, you're against him. You know, I've had a lot of people say, well, I, you know, I haven't made a decision. Now you, you, you can't straddle the fence with Jesus. That's, there's no neutrality in this battle. Jesus said, you're either with me or you're against me. I told you, he's from Tennessee. 
You're either with me or you're against me. Which one are you? Are you with him or are you against him, beloved? You know, Revelation chapter 21, the, uh, verse 8, the last book of the Bible, it warns that the fearful and the cowards amongst God's people, it says, will be cast into the burning, boiling, bubbling flames of the lake of fire on the day of judgment, and they will live there forever. Cowards. You had the Spirit of God in you. You had the grace of God on you, but you would not admit that you belonged to me. You wouldn't live for me. You wouldn't confess me. Be gone, out of my sight. You see, beloved, when you read the book of Acts, the apostles, they were jailbirds, by the way. All of them, all 12 of them got arrested, right? <laughs> Including Matthias at that time. And they got thrown. The Sanhedrin had them thrown into the jail. And so here they are in the jail, and then God sends an angel at night, and he springs them. Now imagine, here's the God standing outside the gate with their spears. The gate opens in the cell. The 12 apostles come out. They walk by the guide. Hi, how are you doing? Now, you know, the guide doesn't see him. He's just like this here. God got him in a stupor, so to speak. And they walk downtown. They're on the steps of the temple, and they start preaching. God says, I want you to go and preach all the words of this life to my people downtown. Peter's a spokesman. He says, okay, we'll do it. So in the morning, they send the guards down to spring the apostles from the jail so they can bring them before the Sanhedrin, and they're not there. <laughs> God had liberated them and brought them downtown on the steps, and they're preaching. And the Sanhedrin says, don't you bring his, his uh, death upon us, not like we killed them. I don't want you preaching that anymore. Don't you go preaching that we killed them and that he resurrected from the dead. I don't want you preaching that. Peter says in Acts 5.29, he says that we ought to obey God rather than men. You decide. We've already made up our man, our mind. We're going to obey God. We're going to do what God tells us to do. Would you say amen out there? So, beloved, what am I saying to you? I'm saying this. People with courage deeply impress God. People with courage deeply move the heart of God. Oh, listen to me, beloved. It took Courage for Moses to confront Pharaoh and Egypt, beloved, with just his staff. He was 80 years of age when he went before Pharaoh, the superpower of the world. And it took courage, ladies and gentlemen, for Queen Esther to go before King Ahasuerus. And that was the king of Media Persia. King Xerxes is another name for him. But unless the king called you into his presence, you would immediately be killed by the gods. In other words, say, I'm the king. Gary's the guard. If someone walked out of nowhere without being invited, the guards immediately kill them because they would think they're going to kill the king. But Queen Esther says, I'll do it. And then she says, if I perish, I perish. But I'm going to do it. I'm not going to let fear hold me back. I know I've not been invited to the king. But somehow the God that I'm worshiping, that's what she must be saying to herself, is going to restrain the hand of those guards and they're not going to kill me. Amen. And beloved, it took courage for David to confront and slay the giant Goliath. Here's the giant Goliath, beloved. He's over almost 10 feet tall. He's got the spear the size of a weaver's beam, and the point of that spear weighed 15 pounds, like throwing a telephone pole. Whew! And the Bible says he had a, uh, the, uh, Goliath had an armor bearer in front of him to take any arrows that were coming. And David, he said to, he said to David, I love it. He says, what are you, a little dog? You're coming to my sight to kill me? And David looked at him. You can just see this little ruddy face. Walks up to him. Today, I'm going to give your head and your bowels to the birds. What? They'll never do that. All you got is a sling. The Bible says David starts running. Scoops down, picks up five stones. By the way, Goliath had five brothers, and King David killed them all afterwards. Whoa, lets it go. Bang, hits him right between the eyes. Goliath <laughs> falls on his face. David doesn't have a sword. So he says, you know, I said I was going to take his head. You know, so he gets on top of Goliath and he pulls out his sword. And David's just a ruddy kid. <laughs> Wham! Cuts off his head, goes up to King Saul. Is this the guy you were afraid of? It took courage for David to do that. And by the way, David was a teenager. Amen? 
But when God's hands on you, you have supernatural power. Come on and say amen. How about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Right here in the book of Daniel, beloved. They defied the king's order not to worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up on the plains of Dora. And they said, when you hear the sound of the, the sackbut, the psaltery, the harp, everybody will bow down to this image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not going to do it. It's like God locked their knees. Whew. They said, we won't do it. And so they took them and they threw them into a fiery furnace. And they heated it seven times hotter. So much so that the Bible says when they brought Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to throw them in the pit, the gods died. So they throw them in. And King Nebuchadnezzar is looking right down at them. And he says that he's counting. One, two, three, four. <clears throat> One, two. How many people do we throw into the pit? They said three. He said there's one like unto the Son of God in there with them. And it was either an angel or the pre-incarnate Christ. Would you say amen? And God delivered them. So I'm saying if you ever want to, uh, uh, God to say to you, that thou art greatly beloved, uh, you'll have to exhibit courage to now live for him. You'll have to exhibit courage to now witness for him and evangelize for him. You'll have to exhibit courage, beloved, to stand up for him when everybody else is standing down. You'll have to exhibit courage for him, beloved, to serve him and labor for him and minister for him. You know, God said to Moses, who had the unenviable task of leading the children of Israel out of Egypt into the hostile land of Canaan. He said this to him in Deuteronomy 31.6. He said, be strong and of good courage. Fear not, be not afraid of them, for the Lord thy God will go with thee. But God didn't stop there. You see, God also said to General Joshua, in Joshua 1.9, as he was to lead the children of Israel, they stood on the cups, cusp of the promised land. And they're getting ready to go in right now. And they don't have a trained army. And these people are professional soldiers, the Israelites. And yet the people in the land of Canaan were all trained soldiers. But they weren't. And General Josh is looking at this is a daunting task. Amen. But God says this to him. He says, be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid for the Lord thy God will go with thee. That's the same thing he said to his predecessor Moses, wasn't it? And beloved, uh, God said also to King Saul, or, or uh, uh, excuse me, King Solomon through his dad, King David, in 1 Chronicles 28, 20, when he took over as being king of Israel because he was just a lad, God appears to him in a dream and he says this to uh, King Solomon. He says, be strong and of good courage for the Lord thy God will be with thee. Now beloved, I want you to notice that refrain, that theme that's repeated by God over and over again to his people. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord thy God will go with thee. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord thy God will go with thee. You know, that applies to you and I too. Be strong and of good courage, for the Lord thy God will go with thee. Come out and say amen. You see, beloved, without us having stout-hearted courage, We'll never hear God say to us, Thou art greatly beloved. Every morning, when I have a cup of coffee, when I come downstairs and make the coffee, in Psalm 27.1, I, I have a mug that someone gave me years ago, so I, I, every time I see that mug, I quote this. Now, I don't drink out of that same mug right now, because I got mugged and that mug broke. But, uh, in Psalm 27.1, the Bible says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? I say that three times before I take my first sip of coffee. The Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? What have you learned so far? Number one, we learned that Daniel had strong convictions. Number two, we learned that Daniel had stout-hearted courage. Number three, and I'll close with this, Daniel had steadfast commitment. Look at Daniel chapter 1, verses 17 through 20. As for these four children, says Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Notice Daniel had. Now at the end of the days, that is those three years that they were being fed, that the king had said he should bring them in, 
Then the prince of the eunuchs, that's Belshazzar, brought them before King Nebuchadnezzar. And the king communed with them, and among them all was none found like unto Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king, in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them. Now watch this. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and all the astrologers that were in all his realm. Can you imagine that? And they were kids. You know, beloved, people don't like commitment today. People are so non-committal today. Because when you make a commitment, it requires responsibility and duty, doesn't it? When I got ordained, I'll never forget it. And I, 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 I shut it in my boots because I had to take a vow. And I, say, I had to say that, Lord, as much as in me is, I will be faithful to proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank God for these last 44, 45 years I've been able to do that. Through His grace. You see, beloved, Daniel was faithful. Daniel was dedicated. I'm saying Daniel was devoted and dependable to both God and man. That's why the king, Nebuchadnezzar, King Darius, wanted him in positions of government. The question is, are you committed? Are you dependable? Now, some of you ought to be committed. But I'm not talking that way. Okay. I'm saying that living and sacrificing, I'm saying that serving and suffering for God does not ever go unnoticed and unrewarded by Him. It is well worth all of the self-denial, believe me. It's well worth all of the self-discipline that it's going to require of you. It's well worth all of the difficulties that Satan's going to throw in your path a spiritual battle to serve and be committed to God. It's worth it all, beloved. You know, the, the church at Corinth, they were all pagan. They were pagan Greeks, and they were some of the most de debauched, degenerate sins there were. But now they got saved, and they got, their lives got cleaned up by God. And now they had to start serving God. And they were wondering, because all these other Gnostics, everybody around there saying, you don't want to serve God. And so Paul writes to them in 1 Corinthians 1558, he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Would you say amen? You see, beloved, God gave Daniel and his friends such supernatural understanding in visions. And the Bible says in dreams, in knowledge, that they were ten times better, ten times, than all the other brain attacks that were trained by King Nebuchadnezzar, so he placed them in positions of leadership and not them. Them who ate the king's fare. Them who ate all the, young, the, all the clean foods. Daniel turned around and, I mean, God, shoot me, Nebuchadnezzar turned around and placed them in the position of leadership because they took their stand. You know, I was thinking, what will he give you and I that are greatly beloved in Christ to commit our ways to the Lord? But do you ever think about this? Here's Daniel. He's down in the superpower of the world. He's a kid. He's in position of leadership. He's got all kinds of responsibility. But do you ever think about this, beloved? Daniel became God's spokesman to that wicked Babylonian superpower, that empire, beloved. And without his moral and spiritual influence, that nation would have been the worst, most debauched nation on this earth. But it was because Daniel was in a position of leadership, he was able to restrain them and guide them to make the right moral decisions. Come on and say amen out there. You know, in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 and 14, Jesus said this. He says, ye are the light of the world. Ye are the salt of the earth. In other words, what he's saying is this world, this evil world system needs the Christians' moral and spiritual light and salt to preserve them so God doesn't wipe them off the face of the earth. So they need us. And that's why we need to live the life before God. Not just talk to talk like a lot of people do. Amen? The question is, beloved, how committed are you to Christ? How dependable, how responsible are you to Christ? How dedicated and devoted are you to Christ? In other words, can He count on you, beloved, to be there for Him when the pressure's on like it was with Daniel? 
Let me close with this. In James chapter 4, verse 8, James, the Lord's half-brother, he says in chapter 4, verse 8, he says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. You have to make the initial step. You have to take that initiative. Draw nigh to God, and he'll draw nigh to you. Now, beloved, the world's principle is just the opposite of that. They want somebody, to, somebody in leadership or somebody that's important to draw nigh to us so we can kind of cozy our way in, right? That's not God's law. See, kingdom principles are different. So what I'm saying to you, I'm saying the Lord looks and the Lord longs for committed people, beloved, in His church who deeply impress Him. Those who move His heart so He can say to them, Thou art greatly beloved by me, like he did with Daniel. I guess the quanti sinon of this whole sermon is this. Are you one of those committed people? Am I one of those committed people? I hope you can say amen, Pastor Joel, pass the bullets. <laughs> I'm in the fight. You can count on me. Thou art greatly beloved. Let's go to the throne of grace.